now to introduce our presenter for tonight's lecture, Mark A. Turdo. Mark has been drinking and researching cider, sometimes simultaneously, for over 20 years. Starting in October 2012, he began making cider at home, first in the bathroom and then in the kitchen. His focus has been on historic ciders, though he's willing to make anything that tastes good. Since 2013, he's written the Pommel Cider blog, where he shares some of his cider making experiments and cider history research. Along with the Pommel Cider blog, Mark also offers presentations to a wide variety of historic American cider topics and traditional cider making practices. So we can't wait to learn more from Mark tonight. And at this point, I will turn things over to him to get us started. Hi, Mark. Hi, Amy. Thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me tonight. I'm really excited to present this. Um, this is actually one of my favorite uh, talks and topics to present, which is this great overview of cider in Pennsylvania. And I'm glad I can share it with your, your guests and audience. Awesome. We look forward to it. Let me start by sharing the screen. Somewhere. Here we go. Okay. So I want to begin tonight by just talking about cider. Uh, as Amy said, cider, Pennsylvania's once and future favorite. Before we begin, I want to make sure we're all using the same language. So prior to about 1800, all alcoholic apple juice was just called cider. From about 1800 to prohibition, so around 1920, both cider and the term hard cider were used for alcoholic apple juice. And then after prohibition through today, both terms, hard cider and cider, are used to describe alcoholic apple juice. Now, the difference today is they're actually pr pro, uh, prescribed by the federal government. Hard cider is anything 8.5% uh, alcohol by volume or less. Or you can make just cider, which is more wine-like, at 7% or greater. For the purpose of our talk tonight, anytime I say cider, I mean alcoholic apple juice. And when I mean the non-alcoholic juice that we tend to think of as cider uh, today, that's what I mean, just juice. I hope we're all okay with that. Um, if anybody has questions about this, please feel free to ask. One of the things I love to point out to people, especially in, in this region in the Mid-Atlantic, is that cider was probably the most common beverage in colonial and early America. Now, I say common, not popular, but it seems like every time you look at what people have in their homes and what they're sharing continuously with neighbors, it seems to be cider is there just about every time. And, and one of the interesting ways to look at this is there are many European visitors who come to America, come to the colonies, and they comment on what they see. They write it down in journals or letters. And uh, these two gentlemen, Hector St. John Crevacor, was, was actually a French officer during the French and Indian War, stayed in uh, North America, wound up living in New York State for a little while, becomes New York State. And he observes that cider is to be found in every house. At the end of the American Revolution, Johann David Schoep, who's actually a, a German doctor with the, the Hessian forces that are fighting against the Revolutionary Americans, uh, he stays after the war and actually does sort of a grand tour of America. And he observes that the common drink among the people of the middle and northern regions is cider. Uh, and these are just two examples of many, many uh, European observers noting that cider is just everywhere. So it became, it was in interest to me to really look at what was this cider that they had? How did they get it? Uh, why would they choose to make it? And when I started this research many, many years ago, is it the same thing as what we have now or is it different? Um, so this tonight is really an exploration of some of those questions. Now to say that everybody has cider in their home is also to say that everybody is somehow in this period involved in making cider. Just about every home, great or small, has some level of an orchard. This is a, a sketch of the gardens and orchards at Monticello and you can see in the upper right, it says orchard, a, sort of uh, uh, curved across the screen. It's quite a large number of apple trees that Jefferson has. He is not typical, however. He and Washington and some of the other people we think of as the founders were able to afford much larger 
farms and orchards. But even working class and working poor people had some number of fruit trees on their property. Uh, this is actually a, a, an early 19th century watercolor from York County, Pennsylvania. And uh, I, I love this image because not only is it young men stealing fruit from the trees, but it also shows a man named Old Doc, who was a, a, a free black man living in the area, uh, shooting at those young men stealing his fruit. Uh, it's it's an interesting way to look at this. And I still am curious, you know, what is he firing at them? Probably something non-lethal, but certainly uh, will drive them away and make them remember not to steal his fruit. But this shows that, you know, e even humbler homes are somehow involved in uh, apple production uh, and, and able to grow something. Now, the apples that they're growing today, if anybody makes cider, and I'd be curious as we go along if anybody does make cider or has experience at it. Um, today, when we make cider, we tend to blend four types of apples together. And these are broad categories. We tend to look at them. We want uh, a blend of sharps, sweets, bitter sharps, and bitter sweets. Uh, these four types of apples bring different characteristics to the finished cider. So it will give you a better balance of sweetness, tartness, you know, uh, astringency, all of these things. These terms are an early 20th century invention. However, in the 18th century, in the 17th and 18th century, many cider makers in America are aware of some of these characteristics. They don't think about it in those terms of sweet, sharp, bittersweet, bitter, sharp, but they are thinking, hey, if I want to blend my apples together, no one, very few single apples give a good cider. So if you just press from one kind of apple, often what you're going to get is something that might be too sharp and not sweet enough or too flat, doesn't really have a flavor. So you really want to blend these apples together to get something that you'd like. Apples are, again, one of the most common, if not the most common fruit grown in the Mid-Atlantic in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And many of them, you could buy the kinds of apples you wanted from, from local uh, orchards or nurseries. Uh, and even in the 18th century, you're able to buy these trees. You don't have to necessarily grow everything from the start. And as we will talk about in a minute, you'll see that you actually can't just grow the apples you want. But one of the things I was curious about is what kinds of apples were they using for their cider? And by that, I mean specific varieties. Like today, we think about Macintosh and Granny Smith and uh, things like that. What were what kinds of apples were they looking for in early America? And it's hard to find that written in journals. It's hard, hard to find that written in letters unless someone has discovered some apple they love and they're trying to tell everyone about it. But there are some records like this uh, nursery advertisement from 1755. This one's actually from Virginia. But it shows similar kinds of apples as were available in Pennsylvania in the 18th century. And I went through and, and basically, if you look at the column on the left, everything from the very top, Hughes crab apple through, uh, you'll see Gillis's uh, cider apple toward the bottom. It's the second one from the very bottom on that column. Those are all apples that are being grown. And I went through and, and tried to figure out where, what is the history of each of those apple types. And by that, I mean, are they American or were they imported from Europe? And it seems like the majority of these are, are imports from Europe. So they are apples that came from either England or France uh, very few other places in colonial America are, su uh, are uh, supplying apples to the colonies, but England and France are the number, the number sort of one and two. Most of these apples seem to be from there, though there are some few American varieties in this. Skip ahead now to 1771, and this is the William Prince Nursery on Long Island. Uh, and you can see that he, they're growing and selling quite a number of fruit, uh, fruit trees. And I did, on the right, enlarge all the apples that Prince is selling. You can see it's, it's quite a few more. Um, and again, what we're finding is the majority of these are European apples, but you are seeing a growing number of American apples. And by that, I mean the Newtown Pippin, Sopa Spitzenberg uh, toward the top there, um, the uh, Newtown Spitzenberg, uh, these are all apples that are coming out of America, the Rhode Island greenings toward the bottom. These are American apples. One of the reasons that I think early farmers are not using a lot of American apples is because they're relatively new and they don't really know how to use them or what they're going to get. 
However, the apples that came over from Europe are probably apples they have a longstanding relationship with. They, they know how they grow both there and here. They know the kind of flavors they're going to get. They know how to blend those. But there really, there really are a number of new apples that are emerging in the 18th century from America, but they're not widespread yet because most farmers don't really know how to use them. They don't know what to expect. So it's going to take a little while for that, for American apples to take hold. Uh, I actually am in the middle of a research process. I've gone through all of the William Prince nursery catalogs through the end of the Civil War to try to figure out, is there ever a point where American apples overtake uh, European apples as far as what's available for sale? And there is a moment uh, in the 1820s where that begins to happen. That's all very, very new research. So I'm still working on that. But to come back to the apples themselves, so I mentioned, you know, there, there's American apples, European apples, and it's hard to just plant the apple you want. I don't know if anybody's ever worked with apple trees, if they grew up near an orchard or had an apple tree at home, but you can't just, if I have a, a, a Macintosh apple, I can't just eat that apple, take the five seeds that are in the apple, plant those five seeds and get five Macintosh trees. In fact, I will get five apple trees, but each tree will have a brand new apple on it that the world has never seen before. None of them will be Macintosh. In fact, they might not be anything like Macintosh. Um, the, the scientific term for this is that apples are extreme heterozygotes. Something more familiar uh, is basically us humans. Our offspring are never clones of us. They're always a little different. Sometimes they're quite a bit different. Sometimes they're very similar. Um, apples work largely the same way so that Again, if I eat that Macintosh and plant those seeds, I will get five apples, apple trees, but none of them will be a Macintosh apple. They're going to be five brand new apples. And very often when you plant apple trees from seedling, you don't get apples that humans will want to eat for any reason. They're, uh, you won't want to use them for baking, eating, using for cider. Um, they're often too extreme in some way, too harsh too soft, too mushy, too sweet, too sour, uh, any number of things happen. So there are actually, I think, over 7,000 varieties of apples in the world today. Humans only really eat and use a very small number of that. And the majority of them just grow wildly uh, and, and are used for reproducing more trees and feeding animals. So that said, how is it you get, you know, how is it you propagate the kinds of apples that you want? Um, you can't just plant from a seed. What you're going to do is something that we don't often think of. And many of us don't, we don't have orchards anymore. We don't, we don't plant fruit trees like we used to. Uh, but the way that you propagate the kind of apple you want is to graft. Uh, and this is a, a, an early view of the different kinds of grafting that you can do. Grafting is essentially taking a piece of one fruit producing tree and in some way plugging it into the tree trunk what's known as a rootstock, of another apple-producing tree. So what we're seeing here is you can graft either from the branch. So you can go, say, say you plant those five Macintosh seeds and you get those five trees and four of them are no good. You don't want to eat them. You don't want to use them for anything. But the tree trunks themselves are good and strong. And one of those five trees has an apple that you want more of. The only way to get more of that apple is to graft it from the tree, its, its original tree onto other trees. So you'll trim back all the trees that you don't like to basically the trunk with some nubs where the branches were. You'll take cuttings of branches, live branches from the tree that has the apples you do like. And quite literally, as you can see in this image, plug it in in different ways. You could either plug the branch into the trunk, a branch into a branch cutting. You can actually put a whole top trunk onto a bottom trunk that's in the ground. and if you do this successfully and you actually put these together and, and seal it, you've essentially created a wound. So you put a Band-Aid on it, a beeswax and linen because you want to keep out insects, you want to keep out water, and you want to give these two pieces of wood time to grow together. And they will do that so that you can actually take a tree that you don't like, trim back all the branches and plug in Macintosh branches. And you will then have a, a tree that produces Macintosh apples. Uh, so this is something that many American orchards, farmers are doing because they do want specific kinds of apples. 
And, and it should be said that when we look at those apples, those apple lists we looked at earlier, uh, most of those apples are not meant for eating. They're not meant for baking. They are meant for pressing into cider. Uh, the majority of apples in early America are really going towards cider production. And the way that they're able to do that is through identifying the apples that they like, that they know how to use. And the only way to then get those is to graft like this. So it is a very involved process and it can take several years. So if I plant a seed to get a rootstock, a tree trunk, it'll still take five to eight years before that trunk is really mature enough to produce fruit. If I graft onto it, it's another three to five years before the graft is producing. So it's, it's potential that it could take 10 years from the moment you plant an apple seed so you get apples to use, which is also to say cider and apples are not settlement food and drink. You don't show up and clear your farm and in the first year plant your orchard and a year later you get apples and cider. It's going to take a little while. And this is actually why Johnny Appleseed, John Chapman, is so important. He is he is very much involved in the cider industry. And by that, I mean, he was a head of settlement that was moving west. So he was in Ohio uh, and Indiana and on out ahead a few years of the major line of settlement. And what he was doing was planting seeds to grow these nascent orchards, these nurseries, so that the tree trunks, the rootstocks would take hold and be strong and, and they would survive in that particular region. And then a settlement would hit. They could then buy those tree trunks, plant them in their orchards, either leave them as seedling fruit and use them or graft onto them, and they would get to having apples and cider faster. And that's really what Chapman was doing, was speeding up the production time for apples and cider for Western settlers. Now, once you graft, as I said, it's going to take a few years. But once those years have passed, uh, you will basically have fruit just about every fall. Not every apple variety fruits every year. Sometimes it's every other year. But you will plant enough trees that you will have fruit every year. And for the most part, you're going to harvest right about now. October into November. In this period, they people believe that cider fruit was the late ripening apples. So things that are coming due, coming ripe about now. Once everything was ripe, what they do is a whole family affair and they would hire day laborers to come and help pick apples. Um, this is a basic, this is basically how they would do it. Either they're collecting balls. Uh, I love, I always, whenever I do this uh, program with kids, I always point out they get to climb the tree to pick the apples and the kids think it's fun at first. I'm like, it's a chore and you have to do it every year. And then it was less fun for them, but I still love that they want to do it. Or you might use what you see that our farmer has, uh, what's known as a panking pole. You literally just beat the branch and the apples fall off and then you can pick them up. But the whole family, it's a labor intensive process to harvest all the apples that you need. Then you're going to do something that's actually kind of gross sounding, but it's important. It's called sweating the apples. Uh, you're going to pile them up under cover so they don't get wet. And you're going to let them ripen a little bit longer, but they're also going to they're going to dehydrate a little bit. And it's going to condense the sugars, the astringency, you know, the flavors that you're looking for. So it's going to make them a little more potent. You're going to let that happen for about two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, you're going to do two things to the apples. Um, if you look to the back left, you'll see there's a horse and the horse is attached to a large vertical wheel. That wheel is set into a large circular trough. And you can see there's a pivot point on the other end of the people there. What you're, That's called a, a cider mill. You're putting your apples in the trough and the horse is pulling that wheel around and the wheel is grinding up the apples. It's not pressing the apples. You're not trying to get juice yet. What you're trying to do is you want to grind up the apples to a small, almost a, a um, applesauce consistency as you can get. And the idea being, you get more juice from a small piece of apple than a whole apple. So you really want to grind them up as well as you can. You're then going to shovel everything off into the press. And the press is that thing in sort of the center of the painting. Uh, you'll see it's got a roof. And there's what's called a cheese, which are layers of apples and straw that you put inside the press and then squeeze that out. The, the straw helps keep all the pomace in so it doesn't squeeze out the sides. It's gonna take you, uh, oh, excuse me, you, you will get with that press about three gallons per bushel. We still get about three gallons per bushel from our presses today. The difference is for them, it could take up to 24 hours. And for us, we can do it in 15 minutes 
you know, it happens much faster. Uh, but once the, the juice is pressed out, they might let it sit for about 24 hours just to, to oxidate. And then within that 24 hours, the wild yeast, the yeast that's in the juice that had been on the skins, is in the equipment, in the barrels, are going to start to ferment everything. And within a month, the cider that you've pressed out, that sweet cider that you had for all of 24 hours will begin to ferment. And within a month, it will ferment all the way dry. And it does seem as though when they're making cider in early America, they're fermenting it all the way dry. So zero sugar. The yeast just goes through it all. Think of a dry white wine. A dry Riesling is actually what these were often compared to in the period. It would be something like that. Now, there are ways to soften that, to sweeten it, that we'll talk about in a minute. But basically, they're going to let it go all the way dry, in part because they don't know about preservation yet. That's not going to be till the 1850s and Louis Pasteur. What they do know is that once it's pressed, the yeast, which, by the way, they think is a chemical but we know is a microorganism, a little wee beastie. Um, they know that the yeast that's there is going to start to ferment everything. They don't know how to arrest fermentation. They don't know how to stop it and keep things sweet. So it's going to go all the way dry. After that month, or to do all that work, oh, uh, I should say, um, not everybody. So you can see, if you look at this equipment, this is, these are big pieces of equipment. Not everyone can afford these. Uh, so you you might have, neighbors coming to borrow the equipment. You can see, uh, and this is a slightly later image than our focus period, but you can see this is the sweet cider coming back from the mill. The mill's the building up on the right there, and they're bringing fresh pressed cider back in barrels on the cart. This is probably really typical. Um, and, and in part, uh, once it's in those barrels, they're going to take it home, and they're going to leave it in that same barrel for the month to ferment. At the end of the month, they're then going to um, what's called rack it off into another clean barrel. And they're going to do that to get it off the lees, get off the, all the dead yeast and all the all solids that have fallen out of the juice. They're going to put it into a new fresh barrel and let it sit from most likely December until March or early April when they'll bottle it. One of the things that's different today, we tend to think of all cider sweet or alcoholic as a fall drink and in part that's because when orchards are inviting you on to their onto the site so you can pick apples and try cider historically though cider was a spring drink that's when it was ready to drink uh, so really you know we should celebrate cider come march april now after it's had time to condition in the barrels you're going to bottle it and bottling is a labor intensive process. You're actually going to pour out of the barrel right into a bottle, cork it. And the reason you're doing that is if you leave cider in the barrel, it, there will still be some evaporation, which means oxygen will get into the barrel. And that means that you will get some, as if you have prolonged contact of cider and oxygen, you'll get, you'll get some oxidation and it will sour your cider to the point that it will be undrinkable. It will not become vinegar, but it will taste kind of vinegary and you won't want to drink it. So glass and cork bottles allowed you to keep oxygen out better longer. So they would definitely every spring bottle everything. And then once they did that, they would store it in cellars and have a vintage enough, enough cider to drink for the year. Most of these families are making uh, or having made enough cider for their use for one year. Now, I quickly want to point out that the majority, uh, you know, if you think about cider makers, the majority of us are thinking of, you know, farmers like this. Uh, and this is a great, great image, uh, you know, new, called New Cider. You can see they're, they're looking at the fresh pressed cider, admiring the, the, the beautiful brown color. Um, this is probably quite true for the 19th century, where it is largely men making the cider. However, in the 18th century, it is not. It is actually largely women who are making cider. They're the ones fermenting. They're the ones bottling. Uh, they're probably the ones blending if there's any of that work to be done. Uh, it's There is a distinct change as we move from the decade after the American Revolution in the 1780s into the 19th century. And this is a good example of that change. Now, everything I talked about is is... Basically, how cider is made historically, 
it's kind of the same process today. We actually haven't changed it that much. But one of the things that I, I, I like to focus on is what was Cider, Cider's relationship in Pennsylvania? Um, and actually, it goes all the way back to William Penn. In 1681, he published these two pamphlets. Uh, both were intended to bring settlers over to establish the, the colony in what would be known as Pennsylvania. Uh, the one on the left is in English. The one on the right is in German because he was actively trying to bring Germans over. And what I love about this is in both of these, he lists all the things that Pennsylvania is good for. And he says things like it's good for wheat and flax and wine and cider. He makes that case, which is wonderful. It was great to read. I have one small problem with that, and that is he wasn't in Pennsylvania in 1681. He hadn't been here yet. So how did he know these things? Because he clearly got the wine wrong until fairly recently. Um, it's It seems as though he was relying on uh, agents and other people who had been here, who had gone back and shared some stories. Because there were Swedes who had settled in the Delaware Valley, had established farms and orchards. So there was a fruit culture going on in North America at this point. But he sort of kicks this off and gets people interested in coming over and saying, you know, the land is good for all manner of things that we want more of. Now, I should say, um, not long after that, in 1685, uh, so when William Penn is here, he's actually, it's his first visit to Pennsylvania, and he is making a, a point of visiting uh, settlers who've been here for a couple of years, and he's saying that orchards are planting, are planted and producing. So very early on, as soon as people are over, they are establishing orchards. Um, in 1696, an Englishman named Gabriel Thomas uh, commented, he was visiting uh, Philadelphia, and he commented, quote, the common planting fruit trees are apples, of which much excellent cider is made. So within less than 20 years of William Penn even advertising for people to come over and settle, uh, they've done that, and they've established orchards and a cider production. Now, it's easy to, to say, as you look at the records, that cider is really common. It's everywhere. Uh, it's, it's what people are drinking. However, you rarely get a look, a, a window into this, uh, like the one that's on the screen now. So the gentleman in the portrait is the Reverend Israel Acrelius. He was with the uh, Swedish Reformed Church. He was here in the 1750s for a short time. He was in Philadelphia, but he traveled around the Mid-Atlantic. And at one point in the journal he kept, he, and I love this for a minister, he actually has an entire chapter that said, that's entitled Drinks of Pennsylvania. And this is everything that he recorded. I think there's 49 beverages here. Um, and, and he seems to have seen just about everything that was common in 1750s Pennsylvania. And if you look at, at the list on the right, in bold are all the cider related products. So what he calls apple wine, I think that's just a mistranslation of his original, which would have been something close to the German Apfelwein, which is a, a direct translation as apple wine, but that's the Germanic term for cider. Um, cider Royal was also quite common. Cider Royal is their version of, of uh, what are sometimes known as six pack ciders. Maybe you've had the very sweet angry orchard ciders. Cider Royal was uh, their version of that. And the way you made it was you you fermented out your cider. You would then add sweets to it. And sweets was a boiled collection of water, sugar, and egg whites. I know it doesn't sound very appetizing, but I've made this. And what you basically do is you boil that together. You add the sweets to the cider. You let it sit in someplace warm for a few months. And it blends together and gives you this really rich flavored, almost port, if you, if you like a Pour a, a sweet port. It gives you that mouthfeel, that flavor. Um, and cider royal was actually very popular. There were people who specialized in making it and and sold it locally. Cider royal with mead. I don't actually know what that is. I've looked. I think what he's saying is cider fermented with honey, which will give you a, a higher alcohol content and a different flavor. I'm not certain of that, but I can't find anything cider royal with mead. And mead, by the way, is fermented honey. Uh, you might hear about it at a Ren Fair. You, if you watch any um, uh, in English historic dramas, sometimes they'll talk about having mead uh, in, in the days of King Arthur. Um, it is just fermented honey. It can be quite good. It is being made here in Pennsylvania, but I haven't found it blended with cider that way. Um, mulled cider, so heated cider. 
And one thing that he notes and other people note is they add a little bit of ginger to their mold cider. Ginger is the number one spice being added. Samson is a cocktail of cider, and it's basically a blend of cider and rum. Uh, it is quite strong. It, it can be very tasty. I have made it, and I think the reason it's called Samson is its strength, and it will catch up with you. And then lastly, you see apple brandy, just uh, distilled cider turned into a brandy, um, something that was done on, on many farms around. They would actually have stills and they would do that. And that's more, again, specific people invested in that equipment. So it would be sort of a local economy that would sell that and make it available. Another way to look at how popular cider was is, is how much was being consumed. And I've really been trying to figure out how much cider were people drinking? And I, I can't answer that as well as I would like, but one of the ways I've looked at it is with a table like this, you're looking at um, what's known as the widow's portion. And the widow's portion was a part of each uh, farm farmer's will. He would actually leave a specific amount of food and access to parts of the home and the farm to his widow if she outlived him. There's no social security in this period. This is that version of social security. So this meant as the sons inherited farms, their mothers still had a place and still had support. And if you look at this list, you can see I've highlighted cider is the only beverage included in the widow's portion. Uh, they're not leaving beer behind. They are leaving some apples and they are leaving uh, quite a bit of cider. And I, I looked at this. So according to... This study, which was a lemon study of a poor man's country, a study of agriculture in early Pennsylvania, he says that according to most wills, uh, women uh, widows are being left 2.4 barrels of cider per year in the will. I did the math on this, and if the barrel is the barrel measurement they had back then, that would be about 31 and a half gallons. So to have 2.4 barrels of cider per year means they would have access to 75.6 gallons of cider per year as a widow or 1.7 pints per day per year. This, this doesn't seem unreasonable. Now, the thing that Lemon did that I thought was interesting was he took that number from the, the widows and then extrapolated and, tr and said, maybe we can understand what a family of, he says, five would need each year in food and other material. And he says that they would have 10 barrels of cider a year, again, at 31 and a half gallons per barrel, that would be 315 gallons or 6.9 pints available per day. Divide that by five, it'd be 1.4 pints per person per day for a family of five. So you actually get more cider per day as a widow. But um, what there, there are some questions here when he says a family of five, does that mean kids? Uh, it's really common to hear people say kids drank cider back then. I have yet to find uh, any period source from the moment they're talking about that says, yes, they drank cider. What I do find a lot of are temperance and prohibition statements saying when I was a kid back then, we drank cider. But there is some reason to, to be suspect of those comments because they were often trying to get rid of cider and other alcohol. And that was one way to do it was say it's ruining kids. Let's get rid of it. Now, cider, as, as I say, cider is in every aspect of life. It's even in our politics. It affects the 1840 election. If you've seen uh, William Henry Harrison, uh, he had the log cabin and hard cider campaign. And, and Harrison said that he grew up in a one room log house drinking hard cider. And he meant something specific by saying a, a log cabin and hard cider. A cabin in this period is defined as essentially a one-room structure. So he was living in the meanest, humblest home possible. And he was drinking hard cider. And today we just think of that as alcoholic apple juice. But in the period and from the 17th century to this moment in 1840, hard cider was a bad cider. It was harsh or thin or insipid. It just wasn't good. So hard cider was not a good kind of cider. So not only was he living in a log, a one-room log house, log cabin, he was drinking the worst kind of wreck cider possible. This campaign won him the election in 1840, the presidential election in 1840. There's a couple of problems with it. He was actually from one of, one of the wealthiest families in Virginia. 
he never spent time in a log house and he didn't drink hard cider. In fact, he accused his, uh, to, to, to um, deflect from his own background, he accused the incumbent of being something of a snob and not liking cider. And this is, this is actually a, a, um, a, a dynamic card. You can pull the tab at the bottom and it will change the facial expression. So this is both of those expressions. On the left, you see that he has a beautiful goblet of White House champagne and he looks very happy and very content. When you pull this down, the cup changes to an ugly mug of log cabin hard cider. This was Harrison's way of basically saying, my opponent is a snob. And like I said, this worked. And Harrison won the election. Um, I actually first gave this talk, uh, this part of the talk, right around the fall of 2016. It was an interesting moment to give the talk. Uh, and it, it added a dynamic to the room that I didn't expect. Um, but you can see cider is part of this election. But cider had actually been part of elections all through our history. Very often in early American elections, uh, candidates would would offer beverages to voters. And we can see here, and this is called the county election from 1852. Uh, there, This is a voting station. And you can see there's a gentleman on the left sitting down and having a nice cup of cider poured for him. Uh, if you look just above and to the right of him, you can see there's a voter all ready to go being carried in to vote. Um, this is actually quite a common scene. Uh, from early American th uh, 17th century to the 19th century elections of there was quite a bit of drinking during our elections. So cider is reaching every aspect of American life. It does begin to change. And, and over the 19th century, it moves from being the most common beverage in our homes and in our lives to something that was considered more rural. Uh, and a little more working class. And you can see here, this is actually a, a Thanksgiving in a, in a Northern Regiment's Civil War era camp. And it's a sutler, so a provider of food and drink. And you can see the sutler has a sign, sutler pies, herrings, and cider. This is a really good example of how cider has fallen from being the American drink to the drink of the poor. Uh, and and we will continue to see this as we look at this. A lot of that reason is because of our change in in preferences and our feelings toward alcohol. And that starts with the temperance movement. So after the American Revolution was won, uh, some people begin to look around and say, OK, we've created a new country. We need a new kind of person to be a citizen of this democracy. And one of the things they hit on was maybe we needed to be healthier in our habits. And drinking certainly became under fire, came under scrutiny anyway. So in the 1790s, there was this thought that we had to be more temperate in what we consumed. And, and this uh, moral thermometer was actually created by Benjamin Rush, who was the Surgeon General of the Continental Army. He was a surgeon in Philadelphia and an early supporter of temperance. He created this, this thermometer. And the idea being all the drinks above were temperance drinks. They were healthy if taken in moderation. And all the drinks below, let's say intemperance and below, those were no good. They they were going to cause problems. And typically, if you look at this, you can see it's basically the difference between fermented beverages and distilled beverages. So anything, whiskey, grog, rum, those things were right out. Those were no good for us. Those were always going to cause problems. However, temperance drinks included things like cider, which was a little bit healthier than wine, porter beer, strong beer. And cider, as you can see here, cider, when consumed um, uh, moderately, led to cheerfulness, strength, and nourishment, which I love, and I need to make this a t-shirt. I still think that's a great advertisement for cider. But this is the doc, Dr. Rush saying, cider is good for us when taken in moderation. And I like to point out, by the way, that above cider is small beer, so low or no alcoholic beer. Above that is milk and water, vinegar and water. Um, and above the best drink you can possibly have is water, according to Benjamin Rush. And I, I like to point that out because they did drink water back then. Uh, they were hyper aware of good and bad water. They wanted to make sure, though, that they had access to clean water. Uh, they were drinking it. They were not only drinking alcohol. Basically, humans would die on an all-alcohol, no-water diet. Uh, and this is just one small example of how they, they recognized that.
Now, temperance in the 1790s through the 1830s basically followed this track of fermented beverages, refined, distilled beverages were a problem. And then very suddenly, right around 1830, that all changes. And a, a way to, to demonstrate that is this uh, temperance map. And if you look at this closely, you can see up above is the land of self-denial. But really what you are worried about is below the land of inebriation. They're very subtle in temperance. Uh, and what the map shows is you're actually supposed to travel from left to right, top left, down, across, maybe get through the land of inebriation and get to the land of self-denial. And this entire journey starts with Cider Inlet. And you can see that little detail on the left there. Basically, around 1830, temperance made cider the gateway drink. So that cider led to all the distilled beverages, all the hard liquor. Cider was the problem. It was so accessible, it gave people a taste for alcohol. And from this moment, from the 1830s all the way to Prohibition, cider came under fire. Cider was definitely the problem. Now, at the same, and, and what that causes is some farmers begin to adopt temperance and they begin to replant their orchards with uh, table or dessert fruit and move away from cider specific fruit or they're they're still planting cider fruit and they're making vinegar with it so basically vinegar is made uh is a, is a last step in the same process as cider is made so you would still ferment your apples as you would for cider but then you would add a vinegar mother to the cider put that in a warmer space than you would ferment the cider, and that will turn your cider into vinegar. That's why it's still called apple cider vinegar. You're, you're basically making cider and then turning it into vinegar. Vinegar becomes a nationally saleable product, and cider stops being saleable, uh, even locally. It becomes something of a local trade. But vinegar takes over as probably the number one uh, uh, money-making apple product. And at that same time, as the 19th century progresses and the Industrial Revolution in, takes over every aspect of American life, something else is, is industrialized, and that's our ability to create certain beverages. And beer can easily be industrialized. You can keep all the ingredients separate until you are ready to ferment them and then bring them together uh, and do that at scale. And can't do that with apple cider. They, again, hadn't figured out preservation yet. So... Once you press the juice, you were going to get cider after a few months. With beer making, again, keep those, those ingredients separate, bring them together when you're ready. And because they could produce beer so at such large quantities, it became very cheap, much cheaper to produce than even cider could be made at home. So beer becomes a more economically feasible drink. And that's this is really when beer becomes our common beverage, replacing cider from earlier. Some other things are happening. Uh, the, there is an invasive species. This is called the San Jose scale. It is another Asian invasive species. It came over uh, in the 18, I think 1872 and is first seen in San Jose, California. By the 1890s, it is in orchards all across America up into Maine. And it does hit Pennsylvania pretty hard. There's actually millions of dollars of damage done to Pennsylvania orchards in the 1890s. So some farmers, again, realizing the market has changed, replant their orchards, moving away from cider fruit to dessert fruit or baking fruit after the San Jose scale has, has attacked their orchards. So all of these things are happening in the 19th century to really change our relationship with apples and cider. By the way, the San Jose scale is still a problem in Pennsylvania, not as big a problem as it had been, uh, but it's still with us. It's still here. Now there is one product I have been able to find that is advertised, is sold, uh, that is cider based. And that is what is known as apple champagne or uh, champagne cider. This one's called uh, crab apple champagne cider. Uh, this is, again, kind of like cider royal. It is a very thick, very sweet beverage, almost like an aperitif, uh, although it's not always seen that way in this period. This sweet Champagne cider seems to be the only cider product that is actually commercially available throughout the 19th century into the 20th century. And again, I think that's partly because our tastes change. Here is something that we can uh, uh, um, industrially produce. Once we're able to buy up cider from local producers, we can then 
store it until we're met ready to add the sugar uh, and the other ingredients to really sweeten it up. And they're able to make that at greater stock. But it does seem to be something that's done by professional champagne cider producers and not something that's done at home. So it is also a big change in who is making and providing a cider product to Americans, to Pennsylvanians. Now that champagne cider is basically what we're gonna see for sale into the 20th century, but you still see some people making cider. And if you talk to modern cider producers, they love to say that prohibition ended all cider in America very abruptly. It just stopped it. And, and I, I became interested in that because if you look at the 18th amendment, and this is the entirety of the 18th amendment, if you look on the left, and basically all that the 18th Amendment prohibits is the manufacture, transportation, and sale of alcohol. It does not prohibit consumption of alcohol. Uh, but you often hear that prohibition is what ended our cider. Now, what is true is their prohibitionists are still saying cider is the gateway drink. It's a problem. We need to get rid of it. When the 18th Amendment comes along, it does outlaw production, uh, manufacture, transportation, and sale of all alcohol, including cider. However, that's as it was written. And it was actually announced in January of 1919 to take effect in Jan uh, uh, January 20, 1920. Yes. Um, within the year from when it was announced to when it would take effect, farmers began to worry well if i press my juice it's going to automatically ferment and it becomes alcohol i can't stop that does that mean i'm going to be in trouble with the federal government does this mean and actually they wrote this does this mean i'm going to get the chair because i made alcohol that could hurt somebody and this began a letter writing campaign and actually what happened was uh many people started writing the federal government the prohibition office and said what are we going to do we have this problem so the Prohibition Department actually released what today we would consider an email or a PDF. I think for them it was a mimeograph uh, that you could make cider at home for your own use up to 200 gallons per year. You still had to get a, uh, a license to do it. You couldn't sell it. You couldn't transport it, but you could make your own cider. So actually under Prohibition, before Prohibition took effect, cider was legally allowed to be made in the home. So I have a hard time believing that cider was was killed by prohibition. In fact, what I think is happening is all those things that are changing through the 19th and the 20th century are taste change. We just lose the taste for cider. It becomes relegated to a rural drink. It's something that, you know, anybody who's kind of hip and cool isn't going to have. Uh, you see that in, in writing people who talk about, you know, going down and getting the old jug of cider. It's just not something that a modern person would drink. Uh, so it suffers this fate all through the 20th century. There's only one company I have found that sells cider nationally through the 20th century, and that's Martinelli's. You, everybody knows Martinelli's. They get they make that lovely non-alcoholic cider that all the kids have at New Year's. Um, they sold an alcoholic cider nationally until 1975, and they stopped selling it in 1975 because nobody was buying it. They'd just been losing money for years on it. So you really don't see national sales for cider it's not something that's made it out into uh, modern america until the last 20 years really uh, these are a little bit older numbers you can see one ends in 2014 one in 2016 but they do show the rise in cider very very quickly uh, at the turn of the 20th century so you can see in the upper one with the purple bars you know, 1999 through about 2008, there's really not that much being made. And very suddenly there's an explosion in cider production in 2009. Uh, the, the graph on the right with the green bars shows something similar. Cider in the last few years has really exploded as far as producers and consumers. Uh, it, you are starting to see it. You probably see it everywhere you go now. Even restaurants are carrying one, maybe two, uh, no matter their clientele. Um, one of the things, though, that I, I should say is with this explosion, it's still not everywhere. It's still not very popular. Cider today is still less than 1% of the American alcohol market. So there are still a lot of people trying to break in and get more 
attention for cider of all kinds. And these numbers, by the way, are probably for those six pack ciders, those sweet ones that come in, in six packs bottles or cans. Um, there's a whole range of cider today that you can have from a sweet six pack cider to something a little bit more wine-like that's dry, that's complex. Uh, so the cider industry is really ramping up right now. Uh, and that's that's one of the reasons I make the case, you know, is, there, is it one of our future favorites here in Pennsylvania? Because Pennsylvania is really leading the development in some of the cider that's happening, some of the cider work. Um, and it's it's fortunate that we have several organizations helping us. We have the Pennsylvania Cider Guild founded in 2014. They're there for largely had been for producers, but they're really now working not only on helping producers, but also some education, some outreach, uh, trying to bring some orchards together with cider producers. Um, there is a Pour the Core annual event. Uh, they're actually here in Philadelphia and I think New York and Boston now. I haven't been to those. Um, that is a for-profit organization and they bring together cider makers from across the region. And then there's the annual Pennsylvania Cider Fest. Uh, that's solely Pennsylvania producers. If you get to go to that, you will find some really tr wonderful traditional cider. Uh, one year, I think I had a peanut butter cider. Didn't think I'd like it. Not sure I would buy it again, but I did try it and I was happy somebody was experimenting with it. Uh, so we are seeing a rise in cider production, a cider culture again. I doubt cider will be in everybody's home as it had been in, in the 1800s or in the 1700s, uh, but it is growing. And as Amy mentioned at the beginning of this, um, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about all of these things. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, recreating historic ciders as well. And I share my research and my cider making experiments on a blog, on my blog called Pommel Cider. Uh, and that is free. Uh, all of this is ultimately leading to, I hope, uh, will be a book on uh, Mid-Atlantic and Pennsylvania cider production and cider culture from uh, colonial establishment through the 19th century, probably through just after prohibition. Um, but there's a lot more to learn, a lot more to talk about than what we covered here. This was a really fast overview of all that. Uh, so at this moment, I wanted to say thank you all for your attention and see if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, Mark. If you, oh, I... yeah, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen, although that's great to have your contact information, I will share that with folks. Um, okay, we'll see if there's any questions. And while people some... are thinking of their questions, I'll comment what was put in the chat, which um, Nancy says, Old Stone Cider in Louisville, Pennsylvania, which is west of Newark, Delaware, blends local mead with their cider. So that popped up when you were talking about those different, that laundry I, list of, of alcoholic beverages. Yeah, written by a minister. I love Old Stone Cider. He does some great stuff. And and actually, uh, I go out there. I make I make a pilgrimage because while he's in Pennsylvania, he's three hours away from me and I don't get there easily. But every time I make it there, I love it. He, he's doing such great stuff. Cool. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, I definitely would. All right. Are there any questions out there? I'm Usually curious. no questions mean I oh. did a great job and everybody got it. You did. No, you did. It was really <laughs> well explained. Um, I'm you. curious about, you know, making cider at home, kind of how, um, how you start. I'm assuming you're not pressing apples in your, in your kitchen. Kind of what is, what is your base? <laughs> You, I mean, you can start that way. Um, there is no one right way to start making cider. Um, so I, I did it a little bit strangely. I had been told for years, you can't make wild yeast cider because it's bad for you. And I kept saying, well, but they did it for thousands of years and they lived. So how is this a problem? And it took until I was working at a historic farm uh, as their curator. Uh, I, I remember walking past one of the farmers who said, do you want any of the juice? And I said, what am I going to do with it? And he said, you can make cider. And I went, of course I can. So I came home with five gallons of cider, walked through the door. And my wife went, what's that? And I said, I'm going to make cider. And she said, of course you are. And this is why the cider was made in the bathroom. She was afraid I would explode some bottle in oh. the kitchen. So she's like, it has to go in the bathroom. I don't want to, you're cleaning the mess up. I'm really happy to say it never exploded. Um, 
So I, I started with wild yeast and using fresh pressed juice. You don't have to do that. It's getting easier to find raw juice, but you can go to, I mean, one of the easiest ways to start this is actually go to um, Whole Foods, I think has mm -hmm. gallon glass jugs of apple juice and they have a Gravenstein. And you could buy the glass gallon jug of Gravenstein, go to a homebrew shop and get cider yeast or Nottingham Ale yeast or some yeast, pitch it in, put an airlock on it. You want to buy the airlock as well. And in a few months, you'll get something that's drinkable. You may not love it. You may you may love it. When I did it, I thought this was great, but it was the third batch I made. So I thought everything I made was wonderful. Um, you can do it as simply as that. You can buy the gallon jug of juice at uh, cider at your store. You have to add yeast to it. You want to put it in glass, put an airlock on it. Um, the only difference between the sweet juice you buy in the store today and what they had out of the press is we've preserved ours, usually with a UV light. So it kills all the microorganisms, which makes it safer, but it also means there's no wild yeast. So you can buy that gallon of brown sweet cider, put it into a glass jug, throw some yeast in. And again, it will ferment over time. Um, so you, you can really, any your, your typical market can buy the basic ingredients of this. Homebrew shop has the yeast. Please, please, please don't ever use bread yeast it is not meant for alcohol. Um, it tends to make something that tastes kind of like bread, but not in a good way. Uh, so you do want to go to a homebrew shop. They are helpful. But if you can get raw juice or press your own, it's a lot more work, but you can get something really interesting with wild yeast. All right, we have some questions that have come in. So is cider using only gold rush apples, the exception to needing to blend fruit? Oh, what a great question. And, and how timely. I just, I would never have made cider from gold rush apples before a year ago. And then I did a talk at a local orchard and they gave me some gold rush juice. And I thought, well, I'll see what I get. And my gosh, is it amazing? Um, no, gold rush is not the only single varietal apple cider that you can get. One of the most popular ones is actually from an English uh, apple, uh, golden russet. You can press that all by itself and it will give you something. Typically when I made a, a golden russet, I'll get something 9% alcohol. And it, after a few months is wine-like. It is beautiful. It is soft and mellow and delicious. Um, but there are a number of single varietal ciders that you can make like using gold rush. Um, Pink lady is another one I just used. Um, traditionally, historically, they never would have done a single varietal with ones like, um, Granny Smith. They, there was a thought that Granny Smith just was no good. I've several people, including myself have made a single varietal of Granny Smith and it's quite good. Um, you know, today we're much less, um, uh, judgmental about what makes a good single varietal and what doesn't, uh, anything that tastes good works fine. So Gold Rush isn't the only one you can you can do that. Like I said, with um, Pink Lady, Golden Russet, uh, there are so many ones that you can use now. Uh, but I'd experiment. I mean, if you like Gold Rush apples, experiment with that. Experiment with other ones that you like. Um, the nice thing too is if you make a single varietal cider and you don't like the way it tastes by itself, and you've made one or two other single varietal, you can blend them together, and maybe you'll get something you do like. Um, the one of the fun parts about um, making cider is even your mistakes will a teach you something but you can fix them and make them usable so i i often enjoy that as well uh is yeast the only difference between cider and regular apple juice um app well if you mean apple juice today as it is sold in the store and it's very clear often like a pale yellow that is, is heavily filtered and preserved again probably with uv light just killing microorganisms um but it's heavily filtered so it's 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 lost some of the the mouthfeel the thickness um it's a different product altogether it's it's been processed essentially apple apple juice now apple cider that you buy in the gallon jug that's brown and sweet and delicious um that's basically uh the juice right out of the apple that's just been preserved and the only difference there is it hasn't fermented. Uh, it originally did have yeast in it, and had it not been preserved in any way, it would have fermented and become cider. 
Um, so really, you know, sweet cider is just cider that hasn't matured yet, essentially. Um, but, you know, it is, it is, as I said, you can make a good cider from anything that is still uh, um, a sweet juice, but you can't make it from something that is sold as apple juice today, that, that thin, clear yellow product. You can't ferment that into something interesting. Hmm. You can ferment it. I just don't think I've never had anybody say I made something and I liked it. Sure. Um, <laughs> There's another uh, yeast question here. So yeah. what is the difference between cider yeast and vinegar mother? Yeah, this is a good one. And and I don't I, I will admit I don't know the science as well as I should. A vinegar mother is a different kind of microorganism. It will not ferment sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's what yeast does. Yeast are these little creatures that eat sugar and, and the term is excrete, that is the formal term, uh, but puts out alcohol and carbon dioxide. A vinegar mother is a different organism. It actually takes the alcohol that's produced by yeast and turns it into acetic alcohol. So what we think of as that vinegar taste. Um, it is, if you've ever seen, if you go to the store today, you can buy uh, natural vinegar with a mother in it. And it just, it looks kind of like a, a jellyfish floating in there sometimes. Some it's got some tendrils sometimes, um, but it's, it's actually quite pretty. Um, but you need that vinegar mother to convert your alcohol into vinegar. Um, but that is, uh, and the other thing you need as well is cider, you want to keep oxygen out of your barrel so the yeast can do their thing. Uh, with vinegar, you actually want to allow oxygen in because you want the, the vinegar mother to have access to that and help turn everything. So it's also a different process, but they both yeast and vinegar mothers are microorganisms essentially or based on that. Mm -hmm. huh. are, are crab apples required to make high quality cider? No, but you should definitely try it. Um, crab, so we crab apples have a bad reputation for eating right most of us never think about eating a crab apple in fact you know crab apples are crabby that's those are negative things usually when you hear them however you there are some crab apples that are really good to eat but they are they really shine when they are added to cider so if you are blending several apples together and maybe it's a little thin and you really want some some tannin or you want some astringency crab apple juice will add that for you. Um, I've had people, some people love where the majority of their cider is crab apple. Uh, some people just want a little bit. All of this is really down to taste and what you like and sometimes what you have access to. But you don't need crab apples for that, but you will get something irrepeatable with other kinds of apples. And, and crab apples really do shine as cider. Mm. And the other thing about crab apples is it, it really can be the wild seedling tree that you see grows on your neighbor's property or, or uh, you know, one that's just sitting there, not getting any attention. If it's still growing an apple, even if they're small and hard and, and what we think of as crab apples, you can still use them for cider. I definitely would not eat them. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> yeah. um, so do modern growers making fresh cider still sweat the apples during the process? That, oh, that's a great question. No one's ever asked me that before. I love it. That I am aware of, of, no. What they're doing usually is putting them into cold storage until they compress them. And one of the reasons for this is because our equipment is so much more efficient, they don't need to give it time to condense the the moisture a little bit, to, to dehydrate the apples essentially a little bit. We can get almost all the juice out with the machinery, so we don't need to use that time. Um, in some ways, that gets us to, even though modern cider making, whether sweet or alcoholic, is still seasonal, still done in the fall, uh, we have been able to industrialize it a little bit so we can do things faster than could have been done historically. And one of those moments is we don't need to sweat the apples anymore. We can just press them when we're ready to right out of cold storage. That's a great question. Thank you. And the last question here on the list is, do you now have a cider press at home? I know I was joking in the beginning about pressing them in the kitchen to make, start making cider, but do you have a cider press? I do. Uh, this comes with a caveat and a, a, a story. So 
in the middle of COVID, I finally decided because people kept saying, hey, I have trees, you should come take the apples. And I had no way to press them. And I felt like I was missing out. I bought what was sort of the compromise mill and press, one that would fit in the house and I could disassemble and move around if I needed to. And it came and I cleaned it up and I got apples. I actually was able to harvest from a, a friend's orchard and blend these apples together, pressed them out. I got the last... I think bushel into the press and I was, it was the end of the day and I was slowly a millimeter at a time turning the screw. And I thought, well, I'll just give it a little more time. I'll get a little more juice, one small turn and the crossbar split. So I actually was able to get cider that day, but I wasn't able to make any more after that. I did replace the, the, the press with the one I had, but I realized what I want to do is probably more intense than that press can do. So I'm on the hunt for something I that's a little stronger, will give me a little bit more juice than I was getting out of that one. And uh, I can still disassemble and store pretty easily. That's but cool. it is it is nice <laughs> to have, like my mother still has apple trees from the farm that she grew up on and I grew up on the same farm after it was a farm. And I really want to make cider out of the apples on the family property. So that's the other reason I want to get figure out where the mill and press I'm going to need is. Yeah, that would be really cool to do. Yeah. So I actually um, see that there is one question that came in in the chat that um, that we can end on unless there's anything else from the audience out there. Um, but it's it's thinking, I guess, through that that cycle again. So if if you have apple cider kept in the mm -hmm. fridge, does it eventually turn to alcoholic cider? And if it's sour, has it turned into vinegar? How do, does that work with the cider that we we purchase? So one of the things uh, I think everybody has experience with this, you buy that gallon jug of cider, you're really excited about it. It's cider season. And then you forget about it in the back of the fridge. And at some point, the plastic top gets blown off. By, I was going to say, it starts to puff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it starts to puff out and then it blows off. And, and, everybody, and people will say, oh, that's, you can't drink that now. It's no good. Sometimes, depending on how it's preserved, that might be fermentation, but often it's just it's degrading and off gassing a little bit um, because it had been preserved. All the microorganisms, so all the wild yeast or any other anything else in there were, were killed off. So it's really just kind of degrading and off gassing. However, if you get your juice, raw juice from a press and it's not been preserved in any way and you leave it in the back it will be fermentation. It will actually start to turn. So you will get, you will get something alcoholic out of that. But typically when we leave it in the bag of the fridge, we forget about it. Um, I wouldn't drink it when it gets puffy like that because it's probably no longer any good. Um, and then it's not going to turn to vinegar because it doesn't have the mother and it doesn't have alcohol to feed on to convert to acetic acid. Uh, so really what you're making is just something that does have growth in it because once you pop the lid, Things have gotten in, but it's not really going to be um, something you'd want to drink. It's certainly not healthy. Sure. That's good to know. <laughs> uh, yeah, please, please don't drink that. Yeah, right, right. I thought I saw another question pop up there in the maybe the chat. Yes, there is a this is going back to your to your cider press. They he was mentioning a, a home alternative to cider press might be chopping apples in a powerful blender and filtering it somehow they're they're that, starting to brainstorm for you <laughs> i love it no and that that is actually um a lot of people will use like a, a blender or something when you you need uh about a bushel of apples to get three gallons of juice so a bushel is larger than we think and if you want more than three gallons you know you're you're adding number of bushels it, most home blenders food processors can't handle it. Every year on the cider Facebook pages, there are stories of people who say, I was just going to try it once at home and I blew out the motor of my blender. Um, so you can do that, but you want something really high powered and, and industrial essentially. The other thing is um, it's, you want to be able to press the juice out of whatever hummus you've ground up. Um, it's not just filtering. You actually want to spend time pressing the juice out because that's where you're also going to get sugar and some of those flavors, the astringency, the, the acid that you want, all those things. Um, filtering will give you a little bit of, of juice to work with, 
but not very much. You actually need to press it out to get anything. And, and that's where you need something that can apply, you know, quite a bit of pounds per square inch. Uh, it's not as simple as just pressing between two, two solid objects. But it is a good thought to use like blenders and things, but you want to use ones that can stand up to the amount of work you're going to put through it. Um, again, if you go on the Facebook pages, people blow out equipment every fall. It's, it's kind of funny to watch. All right. I think this is our grand finale for tonight, which is a loaded question. Oh, I always boy. like these questions when they start to play favorites are always the toughest. <laughs> so they're asking about, um, you know, some of the hard cider that you can purchase maybe in our supermarkets or distributors. Um, maybe some of some of your favorites. It says, what is the best tasting? But I know that's all all for different. Oh. Tastes. What are what are some of your favorites? And I guess I would challenge you also if since tonight's focus was on Pennsylvania ciders, if um, there's any specific cideries in Pennsylvania that you want to mention. All great questions. So I make a studious effort to never tell people what I like and dislike. And I say that because when I give these talks, sometimes there's producers in the audience and, and I'm not trying to offend them. I will say this, though. I am almost never partial to six-pack ciders. We all started. I mean, I, I, if any of you are cider drinkers, you most likely started with something called Woodchuck, which is a Vermont cider that was produced in the late 1990s. And for a while, it was the only cider you could get in the store anywhere in America. And I think we all had a Woodchuck at some point and started that way. When I had that first Woodchuck, my mind kind of melted. I went, this is amazing. And I had been researching the American American history for a while at that point and had heard cider all the time and thought, well, this is what they were drinking. This is great. I mean, it, I could have been a revolutionary. Um, I think we all start with something like that. I will say that today, I don't, I, it has been a while. It has been years since I've had a woodchuck. I wouldn't turn it down. I just don't seek it out. That said, um, Angry Orchard is my favorite example of this. Uh, Angry Orchard produces a variety of six-pack ciders you can buy in the store, and people love them, and they're a really great way to, to sort of introduce yourself to what cider can be. I don't gravitate toward their six-pack ciders, but they are they have a, a, an experimentation station up in Walden, New York, where they are producing really funky, weird, beautiful, delicious things. Um, and it's quite literally the six pack ciders kind of fund that work. And, you know, I think they're a great example of like, you really can make something for everybody because this stuff, this, these tastes are so personal that just because I like something doesn't mean you will, even if we like the same kind of profile. Uh, so, you know, I also think it's really important to sort of experiment and figure out what you like. Um, I think so again I won't gravitate toward that. I tend to gravitate gravitate almost immediately to anything in a wine size bottle with a cork. That most likely is going to be a cider made by a small producer. Um it's going to be under a wine license. It's going to be 7% alcohol or more. It's going to drink like a wine. It's going to be complex. Uh and I'm going to immediately think I'm going to like that. Sometimes I I've been wrong. But you know, that's I, I do tend to judge by packaging. The problem with that is things are changing now. and People are moving toward cans and they're moving toward um, other kinds of packaging. So it's not as easy anymore to say, well, I only like things in big wine bottles. Uh, so you really have to go out and experiment. But that's also the fun part of this is uh, whenever we travel, we went to Ireland for a, a belated honeymoon and we literally went to cideries all throughout Ireland. It's a great way to travel any place you're going to. Um, which is all to say, uh, the ciders that I like, like I say, tend to be in wine bottles. They tend to be a little more complex in Pennsylvania. There are a few people I think are doing amazing work, uh, Plowman cider in Adams County, uh, Dressler cider in, uh, Downingtown, um, uh, Manoff market, which is actually a small, uh, market outside of New Hope in Pennsylvania, Bucks County. Uh, they really just started making cider not long ago because uh, Gary Manoff looked at his wife and said, this has been my dream for years. And she went, since when? I've known you your whole life. 
uh, but they're doing amazing stuff and they're planting early cider apples. They're, they're really trying to sort of revive things. Um, somebody mentioned Old Stone Cidery. Uh, they, they literally regrafted all their trees with English cider apples after his father went over to England and just got enthusiastic about that. Uh, I think they do some pretty amazing work. Uh, so those are sort of the ones that I tend to think about and gravitate toward. Uh, I also think I make pretty good cider. So we have a lot of that here. Um, <laughs> mine's not for sale though. So, um, but yeah, I, you know, because this is also specific to you, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun also. And this is a good time of year to do it. Just go out and find an orchard. They've probably started to make their own cider and see if you like it, you know, and, and Old Stone is a good example. When I first went there, I, I was talking to, to the, the couple, the family, and I said, have you thought about making something super dry? And he went, no. And a year later, he's making something super dry. And he remembered me and said, oh, yeah, you, you're the reason I'm doing this. I was like, yeah, but it's selling. And it was. So That's have conversations. Let people know, like, hey, I like this, but I also like this. And have you thought about that? Because if the beautiful thing about cider right now, the cider culture, is it's so small. You as the consumer can actually be part of the conversation. Um, so I would, I would definitely share thoughts with folks. Yeah. I've had the cider from Manoffs. It's delicious. <laughs> oh, have you? Oh yeah. I, yeah. I, I just, I just got Harrison juice from them, which started fermenting this morning. So they're, uh, they're really great. I, I love their stuff. Yeah. Someone chimed in when you were talking about the cider in, in the bottle and, and just asked how long is it good after opening? If you compare uh, it to like drinking wine or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Um, couple things about cider if it's in the bottle and the bottle's not open you can keep it for years um there are people who will say it's no good after two or three years if it's high enough alcohol content it will keep like wine for a very very long time provided the cork is intact um once you open it um it depends on how much you take out of the bottle right away anywhere from two to four days, I think is sort of the agreed by if you have just a little bit and there's not a lot of oxygen in there, you're fine. Um, if you open it, pour most of it out and it's mostly oxygen in the bottle after a few days, it's going to start to turn it sour depending on how preserved it is. Um, if it's preserved, it'll last a little bit longer. If it's not preserved, it'll start to sour faster. Um, cider doesn't last that long in my house. So I, I really don't have this problem, um, sure. <laughs> but you know, a couple, a couple days, a couple, four days is pretty good. And if you're putting it in the refrigerator, you might get to like day five or six. Wonderful. Mark, that was a lot of questions. Thank you so much for taking oh, the time to answer them all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Obviously, obviously, you were getting people's minds to start to start thinking about. So um, we really appreciate you being with us tonight and sharing all of your research and knowledge with us. And um Mark has shared some links with me that I will be putting on our resource page. And like mm -hmm. I mentioned, I will be uploading the recording and sharing that with everyone. So you'll be able to come back and relive some of the, the historic points that Mark has shared with us tonight. So again, thank you for taking the time to be with us. And thank you to everyone who's still with us out there. And we'll see you next month. All right. Good Thanks, night, everybody. everybody.